had been pretty static for, you know, over 300 years. You have a ship, you have cannon, and um, the age of sail probably overcame the age of galleys. You know, we used to fight with galleys that had rams, and, uh, uh, but the age of sail, because of the developments of a uh, hull design, uh, were able to mount ships uh, like at this battle, Santa Tristan uh, was, uh, had 140 guns, believe it or not. And uh, the Victory had 100 guns. And so these were floating platforms. However, the technology of ordnance had not truly changed during this period. We got larger guns. Um, we had more accurate guns. Uh, the key to the British success, in part, was because uh, of several factors, all technological improvements. You know, they coppered the bottom of those ships, making them faster. They uh, actually had signal flags that no one else used. Uh, I think the, one of the great improvements is they developed what's called a carronade, and that's the short-barreled heavy gun. So by being short-barreled, because look how they're fighting. So you don't have to have great range. So a carronade could give you a heavier gun, like a 42-pounder or a 32-pounder, with less weight. So that meant you could put more guns on your ship, and you know, you're firing broadsides. And you could load your gun faster, because they had special carriages. Uh, everyone in here, um, in the monitor center, we have an example of carronades and their unique slide carriage which enable them just to turn it and load the gun uh, not in relative safety or safer than you know sticking your head out of the gun port uh, so uh, i have to say so um you know we were making some changes but none of them really had a huge impact on how we are fighting but um, ordnance is going to change because ships change Motive power changes, how we build the ships changes, and that's going to every change gets a reaction, correct? And so I, my goal is always to sink a ship, and if I don't have the guns to do it, I better design the guns that can. Now, one of the big things that's going to really bring forth a great changes to naval warfare and the guns that we use will be the advent of steam power. This is the USS Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi was one of the ships that went to Japan. You know, the Japanese, oh my gosh, how can you move your ship without sails? The Mississippi could do so. And it's, of course, is a paddle wheel vessel, which did make all the um, officers happy because it lessened your broadside. But what it did do is enable you to move your ship to get the advantage over your enemy. Very quickly, they're going to make another change to motive power, and that's going to be the design of the screw propeller. Uh, Francis Pettit Smith and John Erickson kind of share the development of the screw propeller. What makes the screw propeller so good? Well, let me tell you. Uh, the machinery on this vessel, the, the Mississippi, is very susceptible to what? Gunfire, right? So if I have a screw propeller down in my ship, what does that do for me? It protects all my machinery, and it actually is a more powerful engine, believe it or not, and uh, enables you to go through the water in a, a better fashion. Um, they have to develop the screw propeller quite a bit over the years. You know, during uh, the beginning of the Civil War, a lot of them had twin blades. If you go down in the monitor center, you'll see a four-bladed um, uh, propeller that was on the monitor. So the, the screw propeller is going to have this huge impact. Now, I have to tell you, um, Everyone wants to invent the thing that ends all wars. Uh, I think they try to do it uh, constantly. Uh, we see that in World War II especially, uh, World War I. Uh, so the first person to step forward with a new concept 
of ordnance is going to be a man, a man known as uh, Henry Paxenhals, Hans, excuse me, Paxen Hans. And, and he will develop what is known as the uh, shell gun. Now, he recognizes that, um, you know, uh, ships are made of wood. And so when you're using traditional guns against a wooden ship, it's kind of like a bowling ball, okay? Uh, it makes a hole. You have carpenters that have sabots. They can fill that in. You know, I think the Victoria, uh, victory was uh, holed several times. Of course, it did not sink. Uh, and so the big thing is the worst part of that ball coming through is it sent splinters everywhere. Um, but, uh, you know, shell gun is different. It's an explosive shell, which is tending to burst against the side of a wooden ship. Now, when you have a shell bursting on the side of a wooden ship, it does not do the same thing as a solid shot. What it does do is create a ragged hole, which you cannot fix very well. And then it is also sending not only wooden splinters, but iron splinters, right? So then it also has sparks. And sparks in a wooden ship do not go well, go along very well. That's why they had with solid shot on smoothbore guns prior to the development of shell guns, we developed hot shot. And hot shot was intended, you know, to lodge itself inside a ship. And because it was cherry red hot, it would start a fire, and that would kind of doom the ship. If you think about the CSS Virginia, two of its guns are set up to fire hot shot. If you go to most coastal defense forts, they all have hot shot furnaces for that very purpose of trying to burn the attacking ship. Shells do a whole lot better. If I have a hot shot, I'm going to go right through you guys right there. Right? And I get, what, two, three? Uh, if I have explosive shell and it blows up in this room, I think we all have some problems. And so that's the whole idea. It's anti-personnel, anti-ship. Uh, it, it's really excellent. I have to say um, it, it was something that is going to change naval warfare once everyone starts to understand really how devastating it was. Um, Shells are going to be detonated on the side of the ships. Uh, sometimes uh, they explode within the ship, but they still hold the ship. If it explodes on your deck, it's you know, devastating to those people who uh, have it. So Pox and Hands writes two books, yes? Yes. And they're different. We'll get into really how they develop fuses um, when we reach the Civil War era. How's that sound? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, basically, you know, you, you, you create a fuse, um, set it for seconds, because that's how rapidly your um, um, muzzle velocity is uh, during this time. So um, we have iron guns, and they are uh, cast iron guns. Cast iron guns have a lot of impurities. Um, and uh, uh, so um, one man, a Yale professor, uh, David Treadwell, uh, came up with the idea of supporting, because you know when you have a shell gun, you're using, inside the gun there's a big explosion that sends the projectile out. Big trouble is, the shells take a larger explosion to make the shell uh, move. And that creates all these gases that sometimes have nowhere to go. And what do they do? Uh, they burst the gun. And so that was one of the great fallacies of uh, shell guns at this time. Uh, ah, here's a great example. Uh, this is one of the most uh, famous events, uh, I do believe. It is the, uh, of course, on the Princeton. The Princeton was a steam screw frigate that was being built. And 
actually John Erickson is involved with the engine on this project. He also designs several guns. He is working with a man known as John Stockton, who is, you know, a uh, upper class uh, person. Of course, he's a captain in the Navy at this time. He'll eventually command the Pacific Squadron during the Mexican War. However, here, he, when he sees Erickson make these 10-inch uh, and 12-inch guns, he develops a 13-inch gun. And Erickson says, that gun is no good. It's going to blow up. And Stockton says, well, you're just jealous because my gun is bigger than yours. You know, however, Stockton wanted to get all the great accolades. So when the ship leaves New York, the Princeton leaves New York, uh, he tells Erickson, we're going to sail at, you know, 4 o'clock, but in reality, he sails at 2. So Erickson doesn't get to go, fortunately, because they go to the Washington Navy Yard, and on the 29th of February, 1844, they are uh, going to be testing the guns. You know, you can imagine a bunch of senators drinking champagne on the Potomac at night. Yay, what are we going to do? Um, we are going to say, yeah, let's fire those guns. You know, the great explosion. It's exciting. Um, and uh, sadly, um, John Tyler's on board. Uh, actually, John Tyler will be below decks giving a tour to uh, Julia Gardner, later his wife, uh, in a special tour of the captain's cabin. And so they all said, let's fire that 13-inch gun again. And guess what happens? It bursts because Erickson realized how it was casted was had flaws in the metal. And so and you can see what that does. Um, um, uh, representatives are killed, Secretary Navy is killed, Secretary of State is killed. Um, it is a tremendous uh, event because of not only who it killed, but the trust of the Navy in the shell guns and larger shell guns becomes under question. And so that's why Treadwell uh, wanted to put iron bands uh, at the breech of his gun so that it gives greater strength. And um, basically, he wanted to have a cast iron uh, smoothbore with wrought iron uh, um, bands, okay? So those wrought iron bands strengthen the cast iron and does tend not to burst as badly, I guess I should say, as a gun without the bands. Uh, the shell guns uh, are going to really have a huge impact. Now, um, onto the stage, you know, the Navy's upset, and how are they going to have a safe gun? Well, fortunately, at the Washington Navy Yard, they have a man known as Lieutenant uh, John Dahlgren. John Dahlgren uh, is, uh, becomes an ordnance expert. He first designs a boat howitzer to go in boats, which could be put together on shore when Blue Jackets had to do land duties. Um, Dahlgren says that inferi inferiority in overall number of ships might be offset by superior ordnance. He also said Paxenhans had so far satisfied naval men of the power of shell guns to obtain their admission on shipboard. But by unduly developing the explosive element, he had sacrificed accuracy and range. The difference between the system of Paxenhans and my own was simply that. Paxenhans' guns were strictly shell guns and were not designed for shot nor for great penetration or accuracy at long ranges. They were, therefore, auxiliary or associates of the shotgun. My idea was to have a gun that should generally throw shells far accurately with the capacity to fire solid shot as needed, also to compose the entire battery of the ship of the same caliber of gun. Now, what Dahlgren is saying is that... Uh, uh, whoa, I don't know why he's there. Um, 
So this is a, a Dahlgren gun right here. Um, you can see it is, uh, uh, the, they're called soda, soda bottle guns because if you notice how the breech and then it expands, the breech is expanded and that means it can withstand the explosion. He actually has vents in the gun uh, which were filled with zinc in case they wore out and one would be undone so that some of the gases would be able to escape instead of causing this major explosion. This is a critical change in a naval warfare. It is a safe cannon. Uh, nine inch, uh, the most popular at first were nine inch Dahlgrens and those nine inch Dahlgrens actually um, were a standard issue on most U.S. Navy ships uh, in 1860. And the idea of uh, Dahlgren was to have a similar battery. Because sometimes you have these ships that have, you know, 32 pounder, 18 pounder, 24 pounders. And so you had to, you know, have mixed ammunition and had to make sure you got the right ammunition to the right gun. So what Dahlgren is saying, well, if we all have nine inch Dahlgrens on a sloop of war, then we lessen that problem. Now, Dahlgren then took his concepts and was able to make larger guns, 10 inch and 11 inch. This is an 11 inch gun, that's just like the guns on the monitor. Uh, they're safe to use. Uh, in fact, the Navy was so afraid on the monitor that it would burst inside the turret, and uh, that would make an unhappy day for uh, the, uh, uh, the crew in the monitor, I have to say. So, basically, uh, what we have here is an accurate, safe gun that can fire whatever type of ammunition you need it to. So you have three types of ammunition. You have solid shot, you have explosive shell, and then you have canister or grape shot. And all those have certain specific uses uh, during the battle. And so this gun was a multifaceted gun. And that's why the Navy really took very great attention to what Dahlgren had done. Um, I have to say, um, they were not satisfied totally with the 9-inch Dahlgren because everyone wanted to have more penetrating power and have greater accuracy at greater distances. So as a result of that, um, a major Giovanni Cavelli introduced the first so-called effective rifle gun in 1845. The English went, wow, we want to see this. They bring it to England because an explosive shell or, or an explosive shell could now be hurled at greater velocity, uh, accuracy, and penetrating power than that of a Dahlgren. The trouble is that uh, when it was tested, after four shots, the gun couldn't be fired anymore. It bore wore out. So that meant uh, we can't use the Cavelli concept. However, uh, Sir William Armstrong, uh, is going to actually develop a safer type of rifle gun. There are several other people that were involved in the creation of safer rifle guns, which are, includes John Paul Parrott, and, which is the most famous uh, rifle gun, and then also um, John Mercer Brooke. And uh, so uh, this is Dahlgren's version of a rifled gun. Uh, this is a, a 20 pounder. His guns were not as successful as Parrot's. You can see how the wrought iron band is placed and it still has that uh, wonderful soda bottle take on it, but his guns were not as successful as Parrot's. Now there's a huge problem in making uh, these guns um, and Parrot really makes a solution. and. Parrott was a graduate of West Point class of 1820. He sets up the West Point Foundry uh, in uh, Cool Springs, New York, 
and so which you know right down the river from uh, West Point and so he figures out he d patented a process to forge weld spiral coal wrought iron cylinders over a cast iron tube he uh, developed the proportional thickness for a wrought iron band surround the seat of the charge in brittle cast iron guns wow this is really pretty tremendous um, he first comes out with a 20 pounder and eventually he'll make as big of guns as 300 pounders uh, those are like Dahlgren's will go up to 20 uh, 20 inch um, shell guns these are huge weapons and the weight of them uh, if anyone is familiar with Fort Monroe the Lincoln gun I want to remind you all weighs 49,000 pounds so that's not an easy thing to move around to, to be supported on a ship uh, so basically um, the um, US is going to um, stick with shell guns mostly by 1860 uh, because of the larger calibers of shell guns and then rifled guns um, they are going to fit pivot guns on the ships to add for the firepower so if you look at the USS Cumberland that will have you know um, 22 9 inch Dahlgrens then it has a 10 inch Dahlgren and pivot and then it has they say 70 pounder rifle gun but they didn't make those in the USA so it's actually a 60 pounder uh, rifled gun in fact when the Battle of Hampton Roads takes place that was the one gun that uh, Franklin Buchanan feared because he thought it might be able to damage his ship uh, of course the CSS Virginia um, I uh, have to say that these larger calibers are going to really cause serious problems uh, for people trying to um, you know operate the guns there it is <laughs> I'm an airhead uh, so uh, uh, so there's a parrot gun and you can see that band now um, once you start trying to build bigger guns you have a problem and Parrot had developed a way to cast iron large caliber guns uh, with a tube within it so that it could be cast hollow and then you put the bands on it and the big thing is is how you cool the gun down when you're putting the bands on it uh, Parrot suggested using um, jets of cold water and some of his guns would burst because the larger calibers 100 and 150 just could not withstand that explosion within uh, so Brook John Mercer Brook who would do as much as triple banding his guns would actually throw jets of warm water and so he felt that that adhered the bands to the cast iron the wrought iron bands to the cast iron in a better fashion so uh, uh, these guns uh, cause a great deal of tech technology uh, and change in metallurgy actually uh, um, you'll find that Dahlgren has to go to Parrot and say golly I have to steal one of your patented items so I can build larger Dahlgren guns because there was this big desire to have 15 inch Dahlgrens and 15 inch Dahlgrens were when placed on a monitor not the monitor but subsequent monitors was the one gun that could actually break through a Confederate ironclad's casemate because you're throwing uh, this heavy shot right at um, you know those shots were 362 pounds so you can see at close range what that would do to the side even though it's sloped armor to the side uh, of a Confederate ironclad and you can uh, there are several battles I could cite like the Battle of Wasa Sound and the Battle of Mobile Bay 
where those 15 inch guns will break through an iron casemate. Actually, Brook, when he develops his Brook rifle, um, he is going to also develop the first armor piercing shot. And he does so because he, you know, thinks he's a great scientist. He thinks, oh my gosh, if I'm going to build an ironclad, I have to figure out how to sink an ironclad. So it was a Sabbat shot, very similar to what we use today. You know, the, fur, uh, the point of the gun or the shell uh, or bolt, as it should be called, breaks through, creates a hole in the side of a ironclad and then the following part of the shot gets to bore into it. And it does bore into it. Uh, and you can look at the monitor the, when next time it's drained, and you'll see where a brook bolt hit it during the Battle of Drury's Bluff on 15 May 1862. And it is screwed in and fired at 300 yards. Uh, and it goes in about three inches. So imagine being fired at 50 feet and just think of what it could have done. Uh, the Confederates never get that gun close enough though. So uh, what can I say? Um, so what is the counter to these new weapons? Um, the counter to these new weapons are going to be uh, basically ironclads. We learned during the Crimean War at the Battle of Sinope uh, where the Russian fleet of eight ships destroys a Turkish fleet of 13 ships. How do they do that? The Russians have shell guns and the Turks do not. And this is going to be a precursor to the Crimean War. Wow, how can we deal with shell guns is a big question. In fact, the French and English navies will actually go into the Black Sea when they and with their wooden ships they can't get back the past the forts at Kinburn. I think that's in the news lately. It's uh, uh, nevertheless uh, since they can't get past it, what are they going to do? So they build what are called iron cased floating batteries, and these things. They, they were pretty simple. They had uh, no slope to their armor, but the big thing is with four armor plate, they did not have anybody hold them. Uh, during uh, um, the Battle of um, the Forts at Kinburn, uh, actually one shot goes into a gun port of a French Lav class floating batteries. They're called floating batteries because their engines could not stem the tide. Uh, so that meant you had to tow them into action and then use their engines as best they could to hold their position. Uh, so this shocks the world. Um, in fact, the French in 1859 are going to build the first ocean-going ironclad, and that is known as Le Gouret, and that is going to have a huge impact. Um, uh, because the English don't have any ironclads, all of a sudden they realize, oh my gosh, we're now outnumbered by all these other ironclads. So as a result of that, what we're going to do is uh, uh, start building our own ironclads. And, and they build one that still floats today. I've been on the Warrior, HMS Warrior. Now this ship had 80 pounder Armstrong rifles, breech loading on board. Um, it could make 17 knots. So the story goes that any ship it couldn't destroy on its own, it could run away from. So, because 17 knots is a big speed. So that, that's a, a huge change, and that's going to change naval warfare. Now, we look at this ship. This is uh, the CSS Virginia in dry dock at Gosport Navy Yard. And so what they had done, they had, you know, the U.S. Navy, when all this ironclad development is going on, they decide not to build ironclads, even though they had invested in what is called the Stevens Battery, 
but that ship never come, becomes functional. And instead, um, they create what is known as the Merrimack class. Merrimack class steam screw frigates, wooden vessels, right, all with nine inch Dahlgrens, with piv two pivot guns, uh, ranging in different calibers, uh, mostly 10 inch Dahlgrens. So what they have is the Merrimack, as we all know, sinks uh, during the of Gospel Navy. Frederick raise it, cut it down to its berth deck, and put this shield, as they call it, 170 feet in length, with 36 degree sloped armor. And so that means that your, your advantage is that your shot uh, will have less chance of penetrating because of the slope size, it bounces off. Actually, during the battle with the Cumberland on March 8th, uh, they had actually coated the sides of the uh, CSS Virginia with uh, you know, ship's grease, you know, pig fat, so forth. And they thought that would help the ships, uh, the shot, you know, to um, ricochet off the sides. During the battle, um, John Hunt turns to Jack Cronin says, don't it smell like hell? And the retort was, yeah, and we'll soon be here because you've gotten bacon frying on the side of your ship. Just think of what that smelled like. Sulfur from cannon, coal smoke, and then bacon, you know, which generally is a happy smell. Um, so, uh, at least for me. So what this ironclad does is it also reinstates a form of warfare, a form of ordnance, that had been long forgotten. In fact, last used in October of 1571 at the Battle of Lepanto. Battle of Lepanto uh, was uh, the Christian fleet led by Don Juan of Austria uh, will actually uh, tackle the Turkish fleet. Um, and the Turks wanted to ram, whereas Don Juan said, oh, no, 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 We've got cannons. It's a, it's a simplified story that's more complex, but the cannons blow the Turks, what? Out of the water before they could ram you. Now, if I have a ironclad, a shot-proof ironclad, what does that tell me? It tells me that I can uh, ram a ship. And why do we want to ram a ship? Well, because we don't have to fire our guns, so it's more economical. We have a screw propeller, and we have iron casings. So you can't stop me from ramming your ship unless you're a whole lot faster than I am. And that was the case in some battles. Uh, the ram became very popular during the Civil War and shortly thereafter. You look at ship designs in the 1890s, and they have a curved bow which is a ram, oh my gosh, let me get good, that uh, will, well, this shows the first ramming of a ship in combat, this is the sinking of the USS Cumberland, there's a Virginia, um, and there's a ram for you. This is a ram on the CSS Stonewall. So what have I done here? Just look at the bow of that ship. So I've got a heavy ordnance firing forward, and I have a ram that's 12 feet long. What am I going to do with that ram? I'm going to sink the ship, and you can't sink me. So this was the great hope of the Confederacy. However, uh, it is, doesn't arrive in uh, North American waters until May of 1865, so they never get to really use it. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see the concept very clearly here. Uh, you know, ordnance is supported by ship design. That, that's the great thing. In fact, the ship itself becomes a piece of ordnance. And this uh, makes it very, very powerful. Now, in this picture, this is one of my favorite of the Battle of Mobile Bay, you see a nine-inch dog ring and then you see the muzzle of a um, 6.4 inch Brook rifle. And 
So it's rifles against smoothbores, and in this case, the smoothbores are going to win. Why are they going to win? Well, because the Tennessee is slow. It can't ram anybody. Uh, the Tennessee is very vulnerable because it's steering chains. It's the, the, the open and close your port shutters. The chain was outside. So basically, um, one uh, ironclad, uh, double turreted uh, the Chickasaw comes right up next to the Tennessee and within 50 feet and, you know, send shots uh, inside through the gun port uh, or hit the gun port. This is uh, very complex. But the, the, the thing that I want to point out here is that we're making wooden ships being able to counter an ironclad, but only because that ironclad is slow and it is um, also disabled because of so many ships that are fighting against it. So this is uh, the height of uh, rifled and smoothbore development. Smoothbores fall out of favor to rifled guns. And in fact, the whole concept of ramming only lasts a few years. And let me go back uh, to this one slide that I think I put it in the wrong place. Oh, there it goes. So this is the Battle of Letha. And this is in 1866, where the uh, Italians, uh, this is during uh, uh, um, the Austro-Italian War, also known as the Austro-Prussian War. Uh, so let's just say it's a bad war and it's being fought in Triez. And so um, Admiral Tettenhoff uh, is going to be able uh, to ram the Italian vessels using a formation called a fletch or, you know, an arrow. So he breaks through the, you know, he always wanted to break the enemy's line, and so it's called crossing the T. And so he's able to do that, not because of his superior ordnance, but because of his use of the ram, very aggressive use. This is the last battle where rams are going to have a major impact on the battle itself. Why is that? Because we start building guns that had rifled guns made of steel with greater range. So in other words, if you want to ram me and I'm in the Olympia, you know, I can start filling you full of holes five miles away. Am I going to get to you? No. Uh, and so that was the real advent ordinance always rules the day until you change your ship's design to counter that new type of ordinance, such as the creation of the aircraft carrier in modern warfare. Uh, we don't need heavy guns. We need planes with, you know, torpedoes and rockets and so forth. Now, so let me summarize what I've been talking about. So we begin the 19th century with smoothbore guns. We had made some changes to their design, making some heavier. We really uh, changed them to uh, have carronades, which are a shorter type, so I can carry more guns on my ship, so I have more devastating power. Then um, we realize that uh, uh, we want to have, instead of a bowling ball effect, or a hot shot effect, you know, which was pretty deadly for a ship, uh, we want to have explosive shells. Now, explosive shells at first had fuses, you know, cord fuses, um, and then we develop uh, time fuses or contact fuses, and they are developed in the 1850s. So that when you're, like, uh, the great example is how John Worden sank the CSS Nashville, which was then named the Rattlesnake. Um, he is uh, about a mile and a half away from that ship. The ship, the Nashville, had run aground. Great Confederate commerce raider. And so he has to range his shots, and then he times his fuse so that it explodes when it 
at the tennis at the Nashville. And so he fires 13 shots and the ship is left burning. Why? Because he's using heavy explosive shells. He times his shots uh, and, and therefore he's able to reach out and destroy this ship. So we have shell guns. Shell guns are going to be replaced especially right after the Civil War by rifled guns. Rifle guns give you, you, know, you think about a shell gun, it goes like this. Uh, you think about a rifle, it has a flat trajectory. Um, you have different types of ordnance. The only thing it can't fire is canister, and, uh, which becomes less and less needed on shipboards because of why? <laughs> we are not fighting at, at such close ranges as we develop longer range rifled guns. So. Uh, that's my story, and uh, I'm going to probably stick to it for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, it is um, really, uh, this, this is the height of ironclad design, okay? Ram and rifled gun. So anyway, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And we have one right up here. Uh, yeah, uh, the waterline, um, you wanted to fire at two things. You know, the question is, where did you want to aim your shot to hit? Well, you want to do two things. If you are fighting an ironclad, then what I really want to do is aim at the gun ports. I want to aim at the pilot house, because if I hit the pilot house, I blind the ship. If I hit a gun port, that means I can get inside the ship, which happens on numerous occasions. Uh, then I also want to shoot at the water line. And the Confederate ironclads um, had what are called knuckles. It's where the casemate comes down and joins the hull. So you have to protect that knuckle with as much iron as you put on the casemate because if, you know, I mean, you can hold the ship fairly easily um, they don't do that to any ironclad during the Civil War. Instead, they um, use other techniques uh, that will defeat them. In other words, uh, with superior ordnance, I can crack a uh, side of a ship. And, you know, ordnance is not just artillery. It's also the ram. It's also what's called the spar torpedo. And we use spar torpedoes with uh, little uh, gun, well, they're not even gunboats, they're uh, torpedo boats. But because they have a spar, it sits at the very end. You know, the big story about the Hunley is that it had a spar torpedo. It hits the Housatanic, it blows, and the Housatanic sinks. But so does the Hunley because the... Um, oppression of the gas underwater will go through the Hunley and if you notice they all died right on the crankshaft. In other words there was no trying to get out of the boat they instantaneously, they didn't know what hit them um, uh, and uh, so I think as soon as they started to celebrate they were dead. So uh, spar torpedoes and actually fixed torpedoes became a great way to try and limit superiority in ship numbers. So that's why the Confederates lay torpedoes at Mobile Bay, where they sink the Tecumseh. Uh, they uh, uh, use torpedoes and they sink many ships, the Patapsico and Charleston Harbor, uh, the Commodore Barry and the James River. And they really go, the Cairo is the greatest example, near Vicksburg, where it was sunk, but it's at Vicksburg now. And it uh, uh, 
uh, basically was an electronic torpedo. In other words, you had a you know, little spark line and the competitors were hiding in the bushes and when the ship went over my torpedo, I put the two coals together and boom. Now the torpedoes at Mobile Bay are contact mines. That's the best way to explain them. In other words, if I hit it, it's going to blow. Well, the trouble is the technology was so uh, was not ready for that type of weapon because you put it in a cast, a wooden cast, cask, and then tarred it to make it waterproof. Well, you know, that only works so long. So that's why only one torpedo worked at Mobile Bay. Otherwise, if the others had worked as crew members on the Hartford say, I don't know how they heard this, but they heard the snapping of the primers from the torpedoes as they went over the uh, torpedo field. In other words, they didn't explode because moisture had damaged their mechanism. Stephanie, do we have any questions online? Yes, we do. Rich at John, how quickly were these innovations transferred and adopted by ground-based infantry and artillery units prior to the start of the Civil War. Parrot guns and some Napoleon-style Napoleon guns are well represented across the national parks here in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Well, um, you're asking for two different types of guns. Um, so the howitzer, which is the 12-pounder Napoleon, you know, has this curling effect like this. It also could fire canister, which is like a big shotgun. You look at some of the paintings of, of the Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. What do you see? Uh, you see uh, a canister being fired, and it just de devastates a section of the Confederate lines. Parrot guns had a different purpose. They had range. They fired explosive shells and solid shot. The big thing is, is that that range, um, uh, I think one of my favorite stories is uh, at the Battle of Pine Mountain, Georgia, uh, General Joseph Eggleston Johnson, General uh, Bishop Polk uh, is up on the mountain looking down. They see a gun crew down there. Sherman rides up and says, why don't you shoot at those people? They have a three-inch ordnance rifle. They fire the first shot, and it blows up in the air. Fire a second shot, it blows up nearby. Joe Johnson says, don't you think we should move? <coughs> and Polk says, no. And the next shot tore through Polk, and they said um, he stood there as if nothing could phase him. You know, he's Episcopal bishop, and uh, then he just crumples to the ground. So that's the big thing, accuracy versus the, the devastating types of shot you fire. So simultaneously with the Navy going from smoothbore to rifles, the same thing happens at the Army. I cannot date exactly which, you, which service used a rifle gun first, but it's virtually simultaneously. Um, and. Uh, at Bull Run, you had both rifles and Napoleons. You had some older guns as well. I mean, uh, the Confederates, you know, grabbed like six-pounder guns from the Mexican War. That doesn't work very well when you're fighting against a, you know, three-inch ordnance rifle or a ten-pounder parrot gun. Do we have any more questions in the room? Yeah, John, my second question is, um, how did a um, pirate ship stack up against, as far as the ordinances, as well as taking on any man wars of, of Britain or the U.S.? And, and the, I mean, mostly pirate ships preyed upon commercial people who couldn't really defend themselves. Mm -hmm. there, as my understanding, sometimes they would send out uh, the Navy's ships disguised as merchant ships and hang clothing on the things, and then when it got close enough, they'd run up the you know, Union Jack or whatnot. Did, Pirate ships actually, when they saw that it was actually a man of war from a country, did they like say, "Man, we better turn tail and run. We can't, can't take on these guys." But as far as the ordinance on pirate ships, 
uh, and taken on the U.S. vessels. Thank you. Um, well, they have mixed ordnance. Because where are the pirates getting their guns? We're getting them from other people's ships. So if I capture a merchant, most merchant ships, especially an East Indian man, in other words, a merchant ship that went from uh, England to India and back, they would arm themselves uh, because they had a valuable cargo, which they had to defend. The carronade was actually first developed for merchant ships. It's a lighter gun and yet has great force because the pirates didn't always blow up ships from afar. They wanted to board the ship. And when you boarded the ship, that meant it became hand-to-hand -hand combat, which, um, of course, uh, would give victory who had the most men or the bravest leader. So I'd have to say that um, uh, pirate ships, um, were they willing to take on a Royal Navy frigate? Well, supposedly Queen Anne's Revenge, captained by uh, Blackbeard, um, actually took on a uh, British frigate inconclusively. Um, British frigates attacked the pirates out at Lynn Haven Roads uh, and were able to defeat um, uh, the pirates they were fighting. Uh, this is Louis Guitar uh, versus, I think it's the Somerset, um, which you had guard ships here in Hampton Roads to defend against pirates. So in that case, pirates lose. Um, so I think that's my best answer. <laughs> I believe we've got a few more questions online, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, were Marine detachments on board specifically assigned to service the main guns of the ship, or was this only an emergency due to incapacitation of the regular crew? I thought they were mainly on board small arm marksmen to counter enemy crews, but have seen photos of Marines working with blue jackets on the guns. Yes, and they did. Um, they uh, were trained in boat howitzers firing. Uh, so um, a captain of Marines, Reuben Tom, uh, and the Marine guard on board the CSS Virginia, Reuben Tom, was in command of one of the uh, nine-inch Dahlgrens. And so, yes, in some cases, uh, they were used quite effectively as gun crews. So, uh, and there are tons of examples. Generally, they're there to fight from the fighting tops as marksmen. But war changed during the Civil War, so you didn't have the same need for marksmen shooting against a ironclad where the crew was in effect better, better protected, although I do know that uh, sometimes you shoot through a gun fort like the Cumberland, uh, shot went through the gun fort and wounded uh, one of the crew members, a uh, member of the United Artillery, Andrew Dalton. Um, so uh, yeah, so it happened, but you know, generally you would want to have enough blue jackets to man all your cannons. Uh, the Virginia only made a sufficient crew until April the 6th. And so, uh, uh, so that's, that's why they used Marines to man one of the guns. Okay. Ray also asks, what is the difference in the manufacturing processes, wrought iron versus cast iron, that are used to make the guns? Nice question. Uh, and... So a short answer, because there's really a long answer, but uh, most guns are casted, because uh, that's a, a simpler process. So, but cast iron is very brittle, and so that's why we ban them if we're going to use. So if I'm going to build a 15-inch Dahlgren, I'm going to hollow cast it, because on lower calibers of Dahlgrens, like a nine-inch Dahlgren, I bored out the gun, so then I had the interior of the gun crew. You can't do that with a 15-inch gun. So 
what I had to do was the hollow casting process. And then after I casted the gun and it began to cool, I then would apply wrought iron strips to make it, uh, um, or cylinders as they would call it, to give it greater strength when it fired. I hope that answers the question. Uh, uh, but that's a simple answer. <laughs> okay. We have one more. Michael said he read somewhere that the, the Dahlgren's 9-inch guns had a low muzzle velocity compared to the Navy's 32-pound guns that were already in service when Dahlgren guns were introduced. Any thoughts or comments on this? Yes, uh, the 32-pounder was uh, the most popular gun in the U.S. Navy circa 1840. Using shells, however, uh, they were prone to burst, and uh, that's a, it's a bad day for the gun crew. And so, because you wanted to use larger projectiles, you wanted to throw them at a ship, and so what made the Dahlgren superior to the 32-pounder is that it was um, safer to fire. That, that was the big thing, safety in firing. And so um, you will see at, in the beginning of the Civil War that they will take 32-pounders and 42-pounder guns, both Navy and Army, and they will um, actually um, ban them so they could rifle them. And so just like you rifled a, a, a musket, you uh, had a rifling machine that would put mm -hmm. seven lands and groove inside of it. But if I'm going to ban a 32-pounder that was already possible to burst, I then had, uh, I had to ban it to be, make it a rifled gun. But those guns burst a lot. And uh, you've got all sorts of uh, examples of that in several battles. And uh, it sometimes turned the tide in favor of the enemy because you have a, sh a cannon blow up on your deck, uh, uh, that's just a bad day. Um, uh, I think that answers that question. Uh, so if I don't have any other questions, I want to thank you all for being with the Mariner's Museum on this uh, wonderful day.